Did you write that? Thank you. Okay. I'm just, I'm just, I'm jumping on a Zoom call right now. So let me call you back. Okay. All right. Bye. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Terry Kimball. I'm the president and CEO here at the Chandler Chamber, but I want to do a huge shout out to my colleagues with the Ahwatukee Foothills, the Apache Junction, Carefree Cave Creek, Chandler Chamber, Fountain Hills, Gilbert, Queen Creek, and the Tempe Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for being our partners on this and um, bringing us some great topics for guest speakers. So I am very excited today. We have Travis Pachank. Pacheco with Fenimore Craig, um, and he is actually um, an employment, and he covers all areas of employment in labor and business litigation. He has litigated cases involving enforcement of restricted covenant agreements, including non-compete non agreements and employee wage and hour claims. He has also successfully defended employers against charges against employment discrimination, harassment, and wrongful termination claims filed with state and federal agencies, including EEOC and the Arizona Attorney General Civil Rights Division. Travis's asset assist employers, I'm sorry, Travis assist employers and HR personnel by navigating them through the broad spectrum of federal state employment laws. And boy, we know that those are changing ever rapidly to ensure compliance, drafting employee handbook policies and drafting enforcement various um, with employment agreements. So Travis, thank you so much for joining us. Well, absolutely. I'm happy to be here and good morning, everyone. Yep, we also have Paula Witkin with the SBDC, and Paula is with us every single week. She has been in the trenches with us answering our questions on PPP, IDLE, you name it, she's got the answers for it. So, Good morning, everyone. I'll try. <laughs> and if she doesn't, she'll get back with you on those. So again, let us welcome Travis, and I will let I will turn everything over to you. Okay. Well, thank you for the nice introduction. I appreciate that. Um, we've got a lot to cover today. I, I have about thirty minutes, and I and I've tried to pack a presentation uh, to give you as much information as possible. So I, my understanding is that we'll be taking questions at the end. Uh, so if you have questions, um, we'll, we'll we'll take those. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see here. Okay, um, let me give you the ob obligatory disclaimer here. This presentation does not constitute legal advice. And so if you have a particular factual scenario regarding your business and, and you need to speak about it, you know, you can always contact me or a Fenimore Craig attorney or other legal counsel to the extent you already have one. I, I just want to give a broad general overview of uh, what I'm going to be covering today. Uh, the governor's executive order effective May 16th employer best practices for returning employees and maintaining a healthy workplace during the pandemic, responding to an employee who tests positive for COVID-19, and, and then I'll just end with a very, very brief primer on the new federal emergency paid leave requirements as those are critically important at this time. The governor's uh, executive order, the stay at home order expired on May 15th, as you all know, it was replaced by the new executive order called Stay Healthy, Return Smarter, Return Stronger. This executive order is the 36th executive order of the year is effective May 16th. And it's a policy that promotes social distancing while allowing companies to return safely and in compliance with the CDC state and local guidance. I just, this is a uh, snapshot of a portion of the executive order which applies to businesses. And I wanna make sure that everybody sees that any business Okay, any business shall develop, establish, and implement policies based on guidance from the CDC to limit and in, in other state and local agencies to limit and mitigate the spread of COVID-19, including the following. And then it gives a list here, A through H, of what businesses need to do to establish and implement these policies. So promoting healthy hygiene practices, intensifying cleaning, disinfection, and ventilation practices, monitoring for sickness, ensuring physical distancing, providing necessary protective equipment, allowing for and encouraging remote work or teleworking where feasible, 
providing plans where possible to return to work in phases, and limiting the congregation of groups of no more than 10 persons when feasible and in relation to the size of the location. So the, the governor saying, and the state of Arizona saying, this is what employers and businesses need to be doing at this time. Okay, the uh, Governor Ducey's office, along with the Arizona Department of Health Services, has issued specific industry guidance uh, to a number of different industries, including restaurants, barbers, gyms, uh, pools, uh, churches, those type of things. So if, you're, if, you, if you fall into one of these categories, or even if there are new categories that are uh, being added to, so you want to check, I, I've listed a link here that you want to check um, on a periodic basis to see if the industry, if there's any industry specific guidance related to your workplace. Moving from state to federal, I, the federal OSHA is, is uh, something I would like to discuss briefly. Employers under federal, under the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and, and the act that, that was implemented in 1970, employers have a general duty to, to maintain a workplace free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to employees. And I want to stress this because this is the overarching duty that employers and, and companies have. You have a duty to maintain a health and safe and safe work environment. And for some employers, that might be, may mean doing more depending on the nature of their business and whether they have coming in contact with customers and customer service or coming in contact with the healthcare industry. And so they may have additional requirements that OSHA requires beyond just the general duty. For a lot of employers, there may, may not be specific OSHA requirements, and, and the state government agency is ADOSH. Um, but, they, but you do have this general duty to maintain a, a safe and healthy workplace. And so keep that in mind as, as, as you're implementing policies, you need to do what you need to do to, to maintain a, a safe and healthy workplace. Um, OSHA recommends that businesses develop an infectious disease preparedness and response plan. And there's, there's a link here for the publication in that regard to help employers. It's a tool. There's a tier approach to determine the potential workplace exposure. And depending on the level of the risk, and I'll talk about that a little later, OSHA provides recommendations on how to limit the spread of the virus. OSHA also provides uh, regular client alerts and industry-specific guidelines. And I've uh, listed the link here at the bottom of the slide that you can access uh, for specific guidance, uh, such as the construction industry, uh, manufacturing industry, and many others. As far as reopening and returning to work, many of you have already opened your doors and, and employees are already coming back. Uh, but to the extent you've not already done so, we recommend, and we, we've recommended to our clients and, and, and others, uh, that they implement a written COVID-19 preparedness and prevention plan. Uh, this is something that uh, is, is it's a, a policy document in writing, and it sets forth standards that the company should follow. It's, it's very good for people uh, who employees that are coming back to work and that are concerned. It, it, it'll say, you know, these are the things that we're doing uh, to maintain a safe and healthy workplace or to at least limit or mitigate the, the spread of the virus. You can't always prevent it. We understand that. But if you have a policy and a plan in place, I think that's going to be better. It's going to make employees feel better if they're coming back to work, that the employer is actually doing something and taking some proactive measures um, to, to limit the spread of the virus in the workplace. And that plan should contain general workplace protective measures. You see the graphic on the right side of the screen. Those are some examples uh, of some of those general workplace protective me measures. And then also policies for employees who test positive or show symptoms of COVID-19. So I, I should say provisions within that plan uh, so that supervisors and employees and management, the company knows what they're gonna do in the instance that someone is infected with COVID-19 uh, or has symptoms. It's important that I think everybody is, is ready for this because it may happen and it has happened for a lot of employers. And you wanna work with counsel, legal counsel to prepare or review that for compliance purposes if you can. The plan should be distributed to employees. And, and again, I think this is a good measure for expectations and reassuring employees that you're, you're doing something to maintain a healthy and safe work environment. According to the CDC and other, uh, other local state and local guidance, older individuals are at higher risk for complications with COVID-19. We all know that. Should I postpone the return to work? No, 
and that, that would likely violate the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and or other equivalent state discrimi discrimination laws. Let those vulnerable employees, those, those higher risk employees, let them raise the issue with you, okay? Maybe they don't feel comfortable coming back, but you don't wanna make assumptions uh, also about them and their willingness to come back. Maybe they need to be paid, they need to come back to work, or maybe they just enjoy working. That's gonna be something that's gonna be up to them. You shouldn't make that decision for them. Don't be rehiring decisions on your belief that the employee is higher, at higher risk of COVID-19 complications. You wanna to try to avoid that, obviously, to avoid discriminatory practice claims. Let's talk briefly about best practices for creating a safe work environment. I'll go into some more detail here, but you know, social distancing, consider PPE for your employees, sanitize and disinfect regularly, take temperatures or engage in other screening measures, and limit business travel. These are things that you've all heard, I'm sure, on the news and, and, and reading a number of things, but let's go over uh, some of these in, with respect to businesses and employers and employees as far as social distancing. You want to encourage remote work or teleworking as much as possible. I know not all employers can do that, but if, if you have employees that are doing it efficiently and effectively, um, at least for the time being, this is one way you create social distancing. So you're not having all the employees come back and, uh, you know, you know, for example, salary or exempt employees uh, that are not hourly workers, they might be good candidates for this remote type work. Uh, if you have hourly employees, you want to make sure that uh, you have a proper uh, timekeeping system in place to avoid uh, unpaid wages and overtime claims. In the workplace, you want to arrange workstations at least six feet apart. And if the employee doesn't have a private office uh, and, and is in cubicles, you want to assess wall and cubicle heights and determine whether those need to be extended or any modifications need to be made. We understand that not all employers can afford to do those things, but these are, are certainly recommendations. You want to reduce face-to-face -face meetings as much as possible. Even though employees may be back in the workplace, they can still communicate and they're encouraged to communicate through email, through Skype, through Zoom, again, creating that distance. If you need to have a in-person meeting in a conference room, you want to hopefully have it in a conference room large enough where you can create at least six feet of distance between the employees. And, and really just, unless it, an in-person meeting is necessary, you want to try to avoid that until the pandemic subsides. You want to close common areas, lounges, uh, things where, where it's not absolutely critical in order to discourage gathering. Similar, close strictly limit access to small areas like conference rooms, th those type things. Again, to, to, to discourage the number of people getting together. Limit the number of employees working customers allowed into a space. You may want to consider staggering employee start times. Have some flexibility. You know, if, if normally you have everybody show up at 9 a.m., perhaps you need to modify and think of ways to, to have a more flexible schedule. Consider bringing employees back in phases as the reopening process continues. If some of you may have already brought back all employees, but or are you're already doing this, but this is a way to create social distance as well. Best practices also depend on the particular industry, so make sure that you're staying up uh, on the applicable guidance as well. We've talked about already a number of ways to maintain a healthy work environment, social distancing and those type of things, but bottom line, you wanna to continue to encourage sick employees to stay home. Clusters of infected employees uh, may require temporarily shutting down your business. Normally it does not, but you know, you look at the examples of the meatpacking industries and the pork industries uh, where they're coming down with hundreds of employees on the line, production lines um, that have, have COVID-19. I mean, and so unless there's an executive order in order requiring these businesses to stay open, they're likely going to have to shut down um, you're likely going to have to shut down a business if you have huge numbers of employees that have come down with it. So, uh, you know, making sure employees, sick employees stay home uh, or, or if they're at work, sending them home, you, you got to do it. Consider improving the engineering controls using the bil building ventilation system. Uh, the CDC does have recommendations for ventilation uh, guidance that you can access at this link here. And, and, and so there's particular guides with respect to that. You wanna to talk to your HVAC companies in your building to see what measures there are. Again, there's, there's a number of things that employers can be doing. You should be exploring these options this time. 
You want to make sure that employees and customers and visitors have enough supplies, soap, hand sanitizer, uh, tissues in your building um, so that they can properly clean their hands and cover their coughs and sneezes as well. I want to talk about personal protective equipment, PPE. Many of you already know what this is. There are probably a lot on the line that hear the term and don't know exactly what it is, but it, it does have a meaning. And I want to just go over that briefly. It, with respect to COVID-19, PPE commonly consists of respirators like an N95 mask. You'll see the, the graphic on the left-hand side here, she's wearing an, an N95 mask um, or K95 mask, gown, shields, surgical mask, and or disposable gloves. OSHA regulates the use of PPE in the ordinary course. So some industries, will, construction workers, will have certain protective equipment that they need to wear and it's regulated by OSHA. And OSHA auditor, auditor come, may come out, or investigator, and, and make sure they are wearing it. Okay? Uh, in the healthcare industry, there's certain PPE that's required for, for, the, for, for them to be, to be uh, wearing. So PPE does have a meaning, and, and, is, and it's regulated. Um, and it's appropriate for certain jobs or industries. There's also a difference between masks or respirators and face coverings. And so a mask is, is something or a respirator is, is defined by OSHA as either a filtering respirator such as an N95 or K95 or a specialized medical grade or surgical mask. If you look to the left of the screen here, you see these uh, specialized respirators that they use um, sometimes in the medical or, or science industries. These should be reserved, according to the CDC, these should be reserved for healthcare providers, first responders, and essential workers required by OSHA to, to wear this respiratory protection. A face covering is a different. It's, it's a cloth or a bandana that covers the mouth and the, and the nose, and that's not typically considered PPE, but the CDC has five criteria uh, for effective face coverings. They must fit snugly but comfortably against the side of the face, be secured with ties or ear loops, include multiple layers of fabric, allow for breathing without restriction, and be able to be cleaned or laundered. You want to make sure that your employees, if they're going to wear their own face mask, uh, that it's appropriate for the workplace. In Arizona, if you're not in an industry where OSHA requires the use of PPE, you still may require it in the workplace for during this pandemic. Some states or if you, if you operate outside of Arizona, if you have operations, there might be different requirements. So you want to check with your state and local governments to make sure that uh, certain PPE is not required for your particular industry. Um, many of Arizona's reopening guidelines require or, or recommend uh, face coverings or other forms of PPE at, at work. And OSHA recommends that this is just one you know, measure that employers can take. It shouldn't take the place of other prevention strategies. So just providing a face covering by itself is not going to do the trick. This is just one measure. And again, PPE should be appropriate to the level of risk. You don't want to require your employees to wear these heavy duty uh, respirators, medical grade respirators, if, if they're not going to be in regular contact with people who may have COVID-19 or customer service or uh, large groups of uh, people. Um, so, so just consider that it's got to be appropriate to the level of the risk. You got to assess the risk. The PPE has to be properly fitted, used consistently, and regularly inspected and cleaned. Is if you're looking at what kind of PPE you should be providing to your employees, you first have to assess the risk. And there's a tool to do that. And this link here, OSHA provides a tool. And, and, and there's a, the risk is determined by a range from low to very high. So most employers are going to be in the low category. Um, that And those are... And, and, and employees that don't regularly come in contact with the public. If you're in customer service, then you might be in the medium category. But when the high and very high side, are, that's going to be the healthcare workers and lab workers and, and first responders. And, and uh, so, so those are, they're going to be more likely to come in contact with those with COVID-19. And so their PPE is going to be, uh, there's going to be additional requirements for PPE for those industries. The second step is to determine the appropriate level of PPE. So again, in the lower risk group, risk group per OSHA, PPE is not required. If you're in the medium risk group, like maybe a cashier at a grocery store, you have employees that are regularly coming in con contact with the public, perhaps a face covering or gloves or a respirator might be appropriate. If PPE is required, or if you're gonna require it as an, an employer, 
you need to make sure that you enforce the rules consistently, have a policy in place, uh, think about it ahead of time. There might be, if you have a large production facility or a large facility and there's a production area, but then there's administrative offices, the people in the production line, they may have different PPE than the, the folks in the uh, administrative offices that are not regularly coming in contact with a number of individuals. So we want to think about those things ahead and have a plan in place. Training is required. If you're going to require PPE, training is required on how to appropriately use or wear it. And the OSHA and CDC websites have videos and tutorials about how to properly wear and maintain various types of PPE. We get this question quite a bit. Of what happens if someone refuses to wear a mask at work or PPE? Generally speaking, they can be sent home. If they're not following your, your uh, safety measures and your company's safety measures, and hopefully you provided this plan and communicated it in advance, um, they can be sent home. However, there might be PPE may need to be modified to accommodate certain job duties. So you want to take a look at before just terminating someone or sending someone home, you know, make sure you're inquiring about what is the issue, especially if the employee has a disability, a chronic medical condition, or deeply held religious belief that, that, that prevents them from wearing a mask or face covering, or perhaps they have a skin allergy and they can't wear latex gloves. They have breathing uh, problems, not talking about COVID-19, but they have a, a chron medical chronic problem with respect to respiratory issues and they can't wear a face covering. You want to find out why they're refusing to wear a mask or face covering or whatever the PPE is and explore that further with them. And, and you may have to provide a reasonable accommodation if it's based on a medical chronic condition or a religious belief. Otherwise, you, run a, you may run afoul of violation of federal law, Title VII, and the ADA and state equivalent law. Examples of some accommodations may include scheduling the employee to work at a time when she, he or she's not closely working around other coworkers or moving the employee work area to a location further away from others, maybe allowing an employee to work from home, uh, unpaid leave, those type of accommodations you wanna explore. You can require customers to use PPE as well. Uh, in fact, much of Arizona's reopening guidance encourages face coverings for customers. If it's required, you, you know, if you're going to require it, you need to make sure it's, it's, the notice is posted prominently, you know, for everybody to see and it's uniformly enforced. You, you want to stay away from claims of discriminatory practices, uh, whether it's a claim or it's bad publicity, whatever it is. If you're going to have such a requirement, make sure you uniformly enforce it and not just single out certain people to do it and others not. Also consider making disposable masks, gloves, and sanitizing wipes available to customers who may come to your uh, place of business and are not prepared and you don't want to send them away simply because they're not wearing that. You have things available for them to wear and, and then they can continue to shop or, or, or visit your workplace. This information is constantly evolving, so please make sure to uh, keep updated. We're constantly looking at the CDC guidelines and other things as they come out, but they're updated pretty frequently. So you can do that as well. You all know how cleaning and disinfecting, everybody's recommending it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but you need to, as an employer, you need to increase cleaning and disinfecting in your business. Don't do the same thing that you've always done. You need to at least, if you document what you're doing, measures you're taking uh, to make sure you're mitigating the spread of the COVID-19. Uh, that's increasing with uh, cleaning with a high focus on high touch areas such as countertops, doorknobs, drawers, cabinet handles. Um, you know, you, you want to make sure you're doing those things. You want to also encourage employees to you know, how to properly wash your hands. It's maybe very obvious, but you know, have signs or have communication saying they need to be washing their hands with warm water with soap for 20 seconds. Um, that they need to be coughing in or sneezing into a tissue or maybe into their elbow and not into their hands. Don't touch their eyes and their face or, uh, after uh, coughing, those type of things. Or throughout the work day, if they can avoid it at this point. And in, in the CDC has guidance for cleaning, disinfecting. It's pretty particular. So uh, you want to take a look. There, I, I've put a link here at the bottom of the slide that provides that guidance. You want to take a look to see if that's something that your business should consider adopting. 
I want to switch gears now to screening measures in the workplace. Uh, we get a lot of questions uh, from employers. Is, should we be taking temperatures? Or should we be doing other things? So temperature checks are currently allowed under the ADA. It's not considered a medical examination by the, C, the EEOC, which is the federal agency that regulates uh, Title VII and the ADA, the Department of Labor. And so uh, it's been COVID-19 since it's be, become a declared a pandemic, there's some additional flexibility that employers have to do these types of examinations. The temperature check, uh, if you're gonna do it, it is something that a lot of employers and businesses are doing. Uh, if you're gonna do it, you need to notify employees in advance. Okay, just don't spring it on them one day, you're just checking temperatures. You wanna communicate this to, to them. Maybe have a, a Zoom meeting or perhaps a, a notice in writing would probably be best with maybe frequently asked questions about it. That would be the best way to do that. Um, assessing symptoms, you wanna make sure that you, t you communicate to the employees that you're not medically diagnosing them by doing the uh, temperature check. It's simply to assess whether they have a fever. The EEOC also says that a COVID-19 patient or someone confirmed with it doesn't always have a fever and a person with a fever doesn't always have COVID-19. So this is not the end all be all as far as screening goes for these temperature checks. You also, in advance of taking temperatures, you want to set a temperature screening threshold that the employer, the supervisors, the employees know about. CDC recommends uh, the threshold is typically between 100 and 100.4. The CDC, I think, says 100.4 is the typical recommended range that employees, if they have a fever of that or above, that they're not allowed into the workplace. The temperature check should be conducted before employees enter the workplace. If they're already in the workplace and you're taking temperatures, there's possible exposure there. So I know it's sometimes difficult, especially in this Arizona heat of taking temperatures, but maybe there's uh, other things you can do to make sure that people aren't waiting out in lines in, in the heat to just get in to get their temperatures checked. So, um, you know, think about those things. There might be uh, multiple entrance points where you have a couple of employees or trained professionals taking these temperatures. Um, and different entrance points to limit having a line. The person taking temperatures should be trained, even if it's, you know, it's not intensive training necessarily, but they should be training how to properly do take the temperatures, uh, and they should be wearing uh, PDE as well, because now they are coming in contact and within less less than six feet of other individuals. So they need to be at a minimum wearing a uh, face covering or mask, gloves. They should not be touching the foreheads or any, any, any body part of the employees. Um, it should be a no-touch thermometer used. Uh, it just is, 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 you don't hold it up against the forehead. It should be at a distance, but close enough that they can get a reading. And then also, the good practice is to pay your hourly employees for time waiting to have their temperatures taken. And that's to try to avoid wage claims or hour issues for your hourly employees. In addition to, or maybe alternative, if, if the employee, if you just, as an employer, you're not comfortable with the whole temperature checks, at a minimum, you may want to have a daily screening certification. And you can do this through a uh, written form that employees are required to fill out before entering the workplace, or perhaps through an electronic questionnaire that employees have to fill out before they enter the workplace. You know, asking questions. Uh, are you feeling sick? Is anybody in your household uh, having symptoms, um, that you took your temperature that morning and your temperature was below the threshold, at a minimum, you're doing some type of screening and the daily screenings are recommended by the CDC. Again, any screening method should be uniformly applied to all employees and performed consistently. All right, we get a lot of questions about what happens if we have an employee that tests positive for COVID-19. And I put together a list and it's not completely exhaustive, but these are general best practices. The first thing is the revelation is, is very scary for the employee, for the employer. Uh, the employee obviously is telling the employer, I have COVID-19. They're in a, in a period of uh, anxiety and worry. Um, so the first thing is instead of thinking about your own liability and what you need to do, offer support, express empathy. That's the first thing that you should be doing and say, you know, what can we do? How can we help? You may even want to call and check in on the employee who's, who's out in home isolation every once in a while. There's 
the stories about CEOs that are of big companies that are calling and checking in on these employees that have it. So, you know, that's the first step. The second step is to notify the employee of the availability of emergency paid sick leave for COVID-19 reasons. And that's the federal uh, paid sick leave or federal F FMLA. But, um, and then other available paid leave that your company may have as policies so that they're not rushing to get back to work, you know, that they have, they have this um, paid leave available that they can use and get paid uh, while they're, uh, that they're recovering. And then you want to contact Trace. You want to ask that infective employee what employees he or she has been in close contact with for a prolonged period of time over the prior two weeks. There, this is all part of mitigating the risk of spreading the virus in the workplace. And so close contact is, is with less than six feet and prolonged period uh, is generally considered to be 10 minutes or more, at least according to the uh, Maricopa County Department of Public Health Services. I think CDC says uh, 15 minutes and, and one of its guidance materials. But I think for purposes of Arizona, 10 minutes or more is going to be a prolonged period of time uh, when somebody's in close contact with someone else. You want to notify coworkers of the potential exposure without identifying the infective employee. That's very important. The, you got to maintain the confidentiality and the medical information of the infected employee. It might be completely obvious to other coworkers if Phil hasn't been at work for five days and or a week or 14 days, it might be obvious to them uh, that he, he has it or, uh, or another worker has it. But even so, you need to maintain the confidentiality of the infected employees. Uh, require coworkers or suggest that they self-assess for symptoms per the CDC guidance and direct them to their own healthcare providers. Do not uh, make diagnosis or uh, give them medical advice. And you want to speak. So after you've done the contact tracing, you want to speak with individuals who had that close contact for a prolonged period of time. And the guidance provides that it kind of separates in a couple different categories. If this is a non-essential business employee, so it's at not critical infrastructure employee, employee should self-isolate for at least 14 days. Okay, so this is the employee that was in close contact with the infected employee. If this is an essential worker, okay, um, the individual may still work so long as no symptoms of COVID, you know, they're not having any symptoms of COVID-19, but, but they need to have good monitoring in place here, uh, daily screenings, those type of things. Obviously, you want to clean this infected workspace. At a minimum, you want to consider deep cleaning and infect the infected employee's workspace, but also consider deep cleaning the entire, uh, the entire workplace. Consider notifying your entire workforce and explain actions that will be taken. If you're going to do that, the best practice would be through a written notice uh, with maybe frequently asked questions attached. You're, you're, you want to try to limit spread of rumors is, you know, about COVID-19 and, and worry. So, uh, you know, it's often recommended that you notify your workforce as well. And if, if you have a customer or vendor or client that was in close contact with the infected employee and you have evidence of that, and you know that, uh, you, should, you should contact those people and let them know. Of course, that brings with it and carries some liability. Uh, but if you if you if it's been brought to your attention and you're aware that this infected employee has had close contact with third parties, they should be informed. The uh, for employees that have tested positive for COVID-19 or have symptoms or maybe are asymptomatic and tested positive, the Maricopa County Department of Public Health has listed the home isolation guidance and the requirements that they uh, remain at home um, based upon the different outcomes here. So briefly, if an employee has symptoms and tested positive for COVID-19, so symptoms and tested positive, they must remain in home isolation until 10 days have passed since their symptoms first started and at least 32 hours have passed, uh, three days have passed since their fever has gone away without any medication and the respiratory symptoms uh, have improved. And that's called the recovery period. Okay. The second one is if, if the, the individual has symptoms and tested negative for COVID-19, then they must still stay home and away from others until three days have passed since they have recovered. And lastly, if the employee does not have symptoms and tested positive for COVID-19, they're directed to remain in home isolation until 10 days have passed since the date of their first positive COVID-19 test was done. 
as long as they have not started to have any symptoms since that test. Does my business need to close if an employee tests positive for COVID-19? No. You need to notify coworkers of potential exposure and follow routine cleaning procedures recommended by the CDC. Now, we've talked about if you have a cluster of employees, uh, you know, that might require a temporary closure, but not if one individual employee or depending on the workplace, if it's a large workplace and you only have one employee that you're not gonna have to close. We also get questions about reporting to OSHA. Do we have to report a COVID-19 uh, confirmed case of an employee to OSHA? It depends. So COVID-19 is, quali is a qualified illness that may trigger OSHA reporting requirements for employers. Generally, employers are required to report COVID-19 cases only if there's three criteria that's met. One is if it's a confirmed case of COVID-19. Second, this is very important, it's got to be work related, meaning there's evidence that the employer has that the virus was contracted at the workplace. So an example of this is if there's a number of employees who have, have, have uh, come in contact or have gotten COVID-19 and there's really no other explanation or source and the employer knows that they likely got it at the workplace, it would likely be considered work related. And finally, the third criteria is this, if the case involves one or more of the general recording criteria set forth in the OSHA regulations. And I just put some examples here, but that might, the case results in death or days away from work or restricted work or transfer or medical treatment beyond first aid. So if they meet those three criteria, then there is likely some OSHA, you have to report it to OSHA. Now, smaller employers, uh, that have 10 or fewer employees, they don't generally have OSHA reporting requirements, but there are certain exceptions to that, um, especially if there's a death that results. So um, not, you know, small employers are not completely free of reporting if, if there are some exceptions you wanna be aware of. Be aware of protected activity of, of employees too. So if you have an employee that comes to you and, and, is, and is complaining, or you believe they're complaining or they're reporting, uh, that the company's not doing enough to protect the employees. You gotta be careful. You don't wanna terminate that employee. There could be some potential liability for a whistleblower or retaliation claim under OSHA or ADOSH here in Arizona. Uh, they're protected if they're reporting what they believe to be a violation of law or an unsafe business practice, and then they're terminated after that. It may seem, it may be a retaliation type claim that might arise out of that, even though that termination may not have had anything to do with that. So you wanna be careful with that. Also, if it, there's a group of employees who are working together and discussing unsafe business practices, and they come to the employer and talk about it, you know, you wanna be careful of, of not taking any adverse action against them. That could be considered a violation of the National Labor Relations Act. Even if you're not a union employer, it still applies to non-union employers. And so uh, they need, groups of employees need to be able to discuss and are able and they have a right to discuss the terms and conditions of employment and the safe business practices. Just recently, an ex-employee sued Amazon for alleged wrongful termination related to protesting lack of safety measures. So that case is in litigation now, the last time I looked. All right. Uh, what if an employee refuses to return to work? Can I terminate them? It depends. So generally, if you have work available and the employee is simply refusing out of fear only, um, then you may be able to terminate them. But there's some important exceptions here. If there's objective evidence that the workplace poses a direct threat to the employee's safety and health, uh, that might mean there's a number of employees who have COVID-19, they're still working, the, the employer is not taking uh, preventative measures, there might be evidence there that uh, there is a direct threat to the employee's safety and health. And so you don't wanna terminate an employee uh, at that point. If the employee is a vulnerable individual, so they have an immunodeficiency or they're elderly or pregnant, you wanna make sure that you just explore these uh, options with them and find out why they're not coming back to work before you just terminate them. There might be paid leave or unpaid leave that may be offered. And a reasonable accommodation may be required. This last area I want to cover just very briefly is, you know, you need to know the new emergency paid leave laws. This is under the uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act. I don't have time to go through uh, all of the provisions today and the nuances and the regulations, but you need to be familiar with them, know them. You can research them. You can 
speak to counsel, legal counsel about uh, any questions you have. But the Emergency Paid Leave Act is one of the acts that falls under uh, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. That, um, under that act, employers are required to provide up to two weeks or 80 hours of paid sick leave for work, workers dealing with the effects of coronavirus. There's six qualifying reasons um, that, that you need to be aware of uh, to, for taking that paid sick leave. Then you have the Emergency Family Medical Leave and Expansion Act, which is a men's FMLA, and, but it's only for caring for a child due to coronavirus because of school closure or a child care closure. And so um, even if your employer is a small, if you're a small employer and FMLA normally uh, does not apply to you, this EFMLA still does. Um, and, and the effective period is April 1st, 2020 through the end of the year. You need to be aware of the notice requirements. There's a notice that you need to post or submit to employees if they're working remotely. Uh, there's examples uh, on, on the left-hand side, but also the, the uh, Industrial Commission has this notice. You can go to their website and get it. You need to be aware of the qualifying reasons for the leave, uh, the rates of pay and daily and aggregate caps of pay. It's all set forth in the notice on the left-hand side. You need to be aware of the documentation that you'll need for the leave uh, to find out, make sure you're, you're verifying the need for leave and also for your tax credit. You're going to be able to get a payroll tax credit it's as a quarterly offset to your payroll taxes for the amounts that you paid for this paid leave up to the uh, subject to the, uh, the aggregate caps, the limits. Just the last couple of things here. If a company already provides 80 hours of paid sick leave, does a company still need to provide emergency paid sick leave? The answer is yes. So it's clear in the law that this, this new emergency uh, federal uh, paid leave is needs to be provided in addition to the leave already provided under your, your company's policies. And you may not require an employee to exhaust paid sick leave provided by the employer under the, its policies before utilizing the emergency paid sick leave. The uh, Department of Labor in Arizona has become pretty active in enforcing this emergency paid sick leave and emergency FMLA. Uh, this is two examples of companies that have been uh, found to have wrongfully denied uh, the paid sick leave. There was another one recently that's not on the screen that I saw as well. So they are taking enforcement action here. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation uh, here. And um, thank you for listening and, and hopefully you got something out of this. Wow, Travis, just talk about putting us all on overload. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. And if you can um, remain on, I know we've had lots of people asking. We will go ahead and make this PowerPoint as well as what Paula is going to give us available. Um, we will send that out to your indi individual chambers. And please, um, you know, reach out to them as well as um, we will also have it on our own site. And um, we'll go ahead and those that registered um, with the Chandler Chamber, we'll go ahead and email those out to you as well. So thank you, Travis. We'll take some questions here in a little bit because I do see some a uh, couple of other things kind of related to um, um, some of the issues that are going on now. So let's hear from Paula next. Paula. Paula is with the SBDC. She is a um, business analyst, small business counselor. And so Paula, give us an update on what's happening with PPP and idle loans. Okay, so yes, just a quick update this morning. So if you go to the next slide, uh, there you may have heard about um, the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act last week. It, uh, it was passed by the House. And as we understand it, the Senate um, passed it yesterday. So this is good news. It's still waiting for President Trump's signature and we'll still be waiting for some additional SBA guidance, but this Flexibility Act is related. It's going to give some, just as it says, some flexibility to some of these requirements around the PPP program. So today we don't have specific guidance. Like I said, it's not official yet. Um, but I wanted to just highlight a couple of the of items in here and that I think will really benefit those borrowers of the PPP loans. So it looks like it's going to um, extend out the time to use those funds from eight weeks to 24 weeks. The deadline to apply for the PPP loan, oh, oh there's a typo, sorry about that, extended to the end of the year. Uh, that payroll forgiveness level, which was 75%, it looks like they're dropping that down now, reducing it down to 60% for 
as the threshold for that forgiveness as far as the payroll um, goes. Um, it extends the six month deferral period for payment. And then it looks like that loan maturity period will also be extended. So I'm, I don't really have, we don't have the guidance yet. I'm sure the guidance will follow once it's officially passed as a law. And so we'll have more details on that. But this is good news for those borrowers of the PPP loan. Next slide, please. Just a couple of reminders. The two sources of information is the U.S. Department of Treasury or the U.S. Small Business Administration. The links are shown on the slide. This is where all of the most up-to-date guidance can be found. So I would encourage you to go and um, look at the documents on those sites as your official source. And uh, the application, uh, the loan forgiveness application for the PPP is also there. We don't really know if anything is gonna change on that application or not. Um, so we'll have to wait and see when they release the new guidance. Just another reminder that loan forgiveness is through your lender. And so as you come up to that eight week period, um, I would encourage you to approach your lender about the loan forgiveness process. So put that on your to-do list as you're coming up to the end of that eight weeks. Next slide. A few more reminders, just continue to make sure you're using those funds, the PPP funds for payroll, rent, utilities, mortgage, interest. Um, we'll have to wait and see in, this, in the guidance that I'm sure we'll be following if anything changes on these different areas of usage, but didn't see anything at this point at a high level view. Um, and also a reminder to just keep those accurate records and documentation of all your transactions. If you go to one of those sites that I just showed you and um, download the application on page 10 of that application, it's an, there's an extensive list of all the different types of documentation that you may be required. So I would encourage you to take a look at that now and begin to make sure that you're, you're gathering up all of that documentation and keeping those records that you're going to need when you meet with your lender for forgiveness. Next slide. Just a couple of updates on the EIDL advances and the EIDL loans. Um, just we are hearing from our clients that our clients are still continuing to receive those advance grant monies and they are also still receiving those EIDL loans. So they're continuing to move through those applications. Um, the um, portal, the EIDL loan portal is open, but still it's only open for agricultural businesses at this time. We're also hearing and hearing from our clients and hearing kind of from the SBA that it looks like those, uh, the loan, EIDL loans are being capped around that $150,000 limit at this time. Uh, there's not a lot of transparency to know what decisions are being made around that, but that's what we're seeing with our clients. Um, but there is, we understand, a reconsideration process. And um, as you're moving through that, as you're contacted by that um, EIDL group, uh, there's contact information uh, that you can follow up on. And just as a reminder, if you do get one of those EIDL advance grants, those monies from what we're seeing are, are still being deducted from that PPP loan forgiveness amount. So make sure you take that into account. Next slide. So that's a pretty quick update, but I don't want to share any details because we do need to wait for that guidance from the SBA um, as this new um, act is passed. Just a reminder about the SBDC, um, uh, the main service that we offer is no fee counseling. We work with small businesses anywhere on that life cycle. Um, we're from the, you know, just the sole proprietors to those larger small businesses. And uh, it is this no fee one-on-one -on -one counseling that we provide. We also have a uh, low or no cost training and have some access to some great research tools that help our business clients. So of course, right now we're doing a lot of work with our clients around the disaster loans, but you see listed here on the screen, many other areas. So as we're kind of moving into the next phase and you feel like you need some assistance, please reach out to us. And there's no catch to the no fee counseling. We're funded by the SBA at the federal level and then here locally by Maricopa Copa Community Colleges. So myself and Marcus Brown are two East Valley clients, and, uh, but we have clients across the valley and uh, typically at Maricopa Community College campuses, but we do have presence at City of Peoria. Next slide. Requesting counseling is very easy. Just go to our website 
and select the request counseling link and you'll just put in your email and fill out a very simple form that puts you into the system and then you'll be contacted by Yvette or Connie, assigned a lead counselor. And what we'll do is we'll sit down with you and have an initial session and just kind of assess where are you at with the business and what are your specific needs? And then we'll look to see how um, your lead counselor and SBDC in general can help fill some of those gaps to help your business move forward and come out of this very difficult time. So, and I believe that's it. And there's our contact information. So, great. Thank you, Terry. Paula. Wow, if you weren't on over from Travis's presentation, I'm sure you are. <laughs> Paula with all the changes that are happening. So Travis, um, our first question that we've got um, that was actually text messaged in, so I put it in the box. With all the rioting and looting that's going on, what do I have to do to keep my employees safe? That's a great question. Um, obviously things are moving very quickly. I think there's some general things that employers should be prepared to do. Obviously we talked about the overarching duty to maintain a safe workplace. They can't, they don't have a lot of control of external forces outside of the workplace, but they, they do have some control over what they can do to pre prepare and prevent. One of which is to uh, make sure that their fire and safety equipment is in working order. If they have their business that maybe there's a risk that, you know, might be looted or might be broken into or set on fire, God forbid, but um, you make sure that the fire equipment is, is, is working, is able to be located, make sure that employees know where that equipment is in the event of an emergency. Um, they might want to work with their uh, lo local fire department or, or inspectors to, to make sure that, that it's operational. Um, also, maybe develop a clear line of communication with uh, local law enforcement. Um, if they're in an area that they believe that rioting may occur or there's uh, protests are going to happen, they want to maybe check on, make sure that somebody in the company uh, is checking on uh, those updates. It's, it's good to probably have one person designate somebody in the company to check on those local activities that are going on and update the employees or at least supervisors um, on, on a regular basis. Now, employees also have a clear communication channel with employees as well. So uh, if they're remote working or they're coming into work, make sure that the uh, you're able to communicate with employees to the extent you need to tell them, uh, hey, hey, we're delaying start times today because of this, or maybe we're going home, uh, we're going to let you go home early because of a anticipated uh, protest or demonstration in this area. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, I mean, I think those are kind of the basic things at this point. I, I don't know, there might be some other particular, depending on the location of the employer, um, but those are some general suggestions at this point. Great, thank you. I know that that's not tied in, but this thing keeps moving and morphing into additional things that employers need to be aware of every single day. Right. Um, Paula, the next couple, I know several of you have asked about the visuals. We will go ahead and get those out to you. So um, you will have those as resources as well as be able to click on those links as well. So, um, Paula, do they expect new rules for PPP will apply to the loans already dispersed or just new loans? From what we see at a very high level that it will have a positive impact, it applies to the loans already dispersed plus some new loans. So this is a positive thing, it's positive. How do you get the idle loan? I was told that they were not doing those anymore. Correct. The idle loan portal is closed. That was through the SBA.gov uh, website. It is only open for agricultural businesses, but for everybody else, it is closed. And we're not hearing anything at this point as to whether or not they will reopen that or not. Okay. Great information. Other questions that are happening? See somebody's typing. So um, anything else, Travis, that after your presentation, you're thinking, oh, I should have said that to the group? Uh, no, not necessarily. Maybe with respect to the one question posed about the, the writing, I think, um, I think employers, one additional thing is employers need to make sure that they have a plan uh, to vacate the premises if necessary um, and, and to secure the premises if, if they can't 
if, if employees are not able to vacate safely to at least have a plan to, to you know, lock down the business and to just to, to secure it as well. That's one additional consideration that, that employers should think about. Okay, should that be an employee handbook? Well, it, it, it uh, at, a, at a minimum, I think the supervisors need to have, have a plan. I don't think it needs to be in a, in a handbook given to employees, uh, but there might be some, you know, some type of uh, Zoom meeting or, or some other type of meeting to address, to address that, hey, what happens if we're, if, if, if uh, you know, if the riots get out of control and they start breaking in, I, I think at a minimum, the uh, supervisors and management should have, have those things ready to go and have a plan. Great. All right. Well, thank you, um, Travis and Paula. You're always great, great information. I really appreciate everything and, and being here. Um, next week, we will have our guest from Desert Financial Credit Union will be on hand answering commercial lending questions and discussing the emergency lending process, um, as well as providing additional resources. So Paula, I think that will go in nicely and hopefully we can have you back again next week. And then the following week on June 18th, mark your calendars, we have a marketing expert, the owner of Commit Agency will be here discussing marketing in turbulent times and how to stay connected even when apart and then tips on pivoting your new way of doing business because this is all new to us and it's forever changing so um, we've got a great um, list of speakers for you and again we will have the SBDC back to give us the weekly updates because it is changing um, on what is going on so again Travis and Paula thank you um, we'll make these um, PowerPoints available to through your chambers that they can post on their um, on their websites that you, for you to download. I wanna thank the Ahwatukee Foothills, the Apache Junction, Carefree Cave Creek, Fountain Hills, Gilbert, Queen Creek, and the Tempe Chambers of Commerce for being our partners on this and providing you with this excellent information. Thanks again. Thank Bye-bye.